why we are studying this uh, unit or in this in general this topic right so this sentence really accord with me so the so social psychologists have found that learning how people understand their own and others behavior provides a clear basis for solving a variety of everyday problems right right from your insomnia to uh, people who are interested in education counseling we have teachers in this group uh, who can echo a lot of things that we are going to talk down and share their experiences uh, so insomnia until poor school performance all of those can be uh, targeted again my personal favorite always right understand own first before we talk about others right that's always the the something that i i really echo and follow in my life okay so what do we have here right high level topics what are we going to cover so we are going to talk about uh, person perceptions and social cognition uh, which means how are we making sense of the information that we receive how does an impression play a role and how how does it uh, get overall organized in memory at high level right um so impression formation using schemas and prototypes so although a lot of these things schemas and prototypes also are cognitive biases and distortions but they are needed otherwise we 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 will just not be able to function and we touch upon that topic a little bit so holding the impressions together and uh, this is i think in this chapter one of the major topics that is getting covered is the attribution theory and possible types of errors that can happen during attribution theory uh so th uh, this this part i think uh, from what i understand this is this science is not yet uh, completely disapproved by anybody it is still evolving we have only scratched the surface of this theory but it's still very very strong very very basic in terms of um, um social cognition approaches and, and especially in education right so this has been still used still still evaluated so pretty pretty young theory if i may put it that way so these are the three major topics that we will cover which then i have broken the chapter uh, the next slides into 10 different topics on 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 across these three uh, high level information right but again from a topic perspective one of the main topics is attribution alongside schema pro this this is a small topic but attribution theory is one of the biggest topic most repeated in in um, say exams and other places out of this particular unit okay so let's go on so yeah uh, perception and social cognition Uh, the guy herald kelly 1950 and there is there is a very famous the kelly experience experience experiment sorry please read it up we will try and cover it a little bit um uh, in the next slide but please read up on that a little more google it it's it's a very interesting experiment right so the kelly experiment is one of the very famous known experiments in this uh, topic so kelly experiment right so what he did was he had Uh, a same professor go to two different class to give give say lectures right and to one class he gave the descriptor saying the professor is rather warm uh, uh, but he is also industrious critical uh, practical and determined right and to the other other team he said he is rather cold person industrious critical practical and determined now here the one of the key key things to look at and it's very interesting right in this experiment that everything that he said about this uh, user to the two group or this professor to the two group is exactly the same except one word right and this is what i highlighted but imagine just telling it to you without highlighting etc most of the thing we would see okay it's exactly the same description only one so it's not even 25% of the overall attributes that were presented to the group Uh, so the professor goes takes the lecture etc and then the of course the students are asked to give feedback on this professor and what happens is that the students who were told that the lecturer was cold rated him far less positive think about it right first you are meeting this person for the first time second the impression that you have have been given about this person by somebody else is more than 90% same there was only one word which was changed in both the feedbacks right and that resulted in a complete different judgment and perception of this guy right that is where kelly's experiment become very strong and then there are a lot of other experiments with lot of such combinations um, to see how it works right and it's time and again proven that it essentially uh, adheres to the to the to the hypothesis that kelly is coming up with right so conclusion if you see that there are particular traits as human beings that form the overall impression for others even if it is just conveyed right to us some of the traits are very very essential in judging a person's personality 
right? For example, everything else remained same, but just whether he's a warm person or a cold person, that impacted the entire impression of the group who was listening to that guy. Whereas his his knowledge, his pitch exactly was the same, right? So that is what they call as central traits. That is where it started, right? So uh, from a central traits perspective, it provides a framework for interpreting the information. Now, this is becoming very important uh, from, from the Kelly's experiment output that there are these some traits which actually overrides everything, right? Uh, the way we interpret information, the way we judge, the way we start forming first level of perceptions, et cetera, are really defined by these central traits, whatever they are, and that provides an interpreting, uh, uh, so sorry, provides a framework for interpreting information, right? Effects on additive thread, so Solomon Nash and others, 1946, they started that the additional descriptive traits is altered in presence of the central trait, right? So for example, in those two descriptions, if I would have said, oh, the professor is uh, industrious, critical, practical, determined, it's all fine. They're all, all, for example, descriptive traits. But as soon as I added, you know, he's warm. And then this, you would start looking at those descriptive traits in a completely different lens, right? That is how our brains work. So we have to be careful uh, in this case, for example, um, uh, for example, when I go to customers, right? Um, if I've gone to gone to uh, a Japanese customer uh, versus, say, for example, a, a European customer, a Japanese customer would say, oh, this guy is coming from India, doesn't know Japanese, doesn't understand our culture. And that has nothing to do with the kind of software that I'm going to talk to, the innovation ideas that I'm going to talk to or sell things over there. But their first impression, all of my descriptive traits would get overridden by saying, ah, he's not, not a person who understands our culture. That's it, done. Right? Their framework of... of, of uh, judging me, interpreting the information that I put, even if that information is exactly the same, it's it's gone. Whereas when I go to Europe or US, now they say, oh, uh, these guys are good with maths, right? He talks numbers, he he knows sales, he knows what innovation is. Yeah, I mean, uh, the impression of uh, cross-cultural, um, the, the impact that India has in cross-cultural sessions these days is we started when we, okay, draw pictures. When you think of India, people used to, around two decades back, draw snakes. Now they draw computer, right? So that impression, that's a central trait in, in their judgment tendency, which will then override all the other descriptive traits that I have, right? So that's a very interesting experiment. Please have a look at it. Go and read, um, have see videos on this topic a little more. It's it's fun. Also get, helps us get good marks on this topic if it comes up. We can put a additional, lot of additional content here. Okay. Um, quickly touching cognitive algebra, additive and averaging. So yeah, we, of course, we started trying tried to start with with mathematical application on how psychology works right but it really doesn't work that way but what are the two models so we have additive model which says that um everything uh, that you think is positive for a person as and when you start exploring that for a person you just okay. keep adding adding to his uh, personality score uh, you add keep adding to his positive impression uh, sorry was there a question in between anyone No? Okay. Am I audible still? Yes, very well. Okay, perfect. So let me continue over this because this are some of the basic things. So I'm rushing through it. I think we may land up, may or may not, doesn't matter. We may land up having a little more discussion around, around that uh, attribution theory. Yeah. So, okay, additive model. So for example, yeah, um, KL, very experienced in IBM, very corporate guy, has a successful career for me. Okay, I rate him. Uh, from my perspective, I just put a number nine on that. Then, okay, I love psychology topics, loves to discuss things, loves to go in discussion. So I put four on top. On top. Oh, by the way, he also loves to do social services. I put four. So it keeps adding to his personality for me, which I find positive. And I continuously keep keep um, uh, the scale of my positive impression of KL higher and higher and higher. That's additive model. But there is another model which says, no, this is this model doesn't work out, right? So then we have an averaging model. And there's a difference in both, right? So in averaging model, as we see, instead of adding on new traits, we start averaging them, right? So we say, okay, five, four, nine. So it's actually my positive impression score is six. Now, if a new trait comes up, 
right where the person is uh, also very neat right and neatness for me is not say for example not not too much of a big thing i'm a, i'm a lazy clumsy guy uh, not too too much about neat, neatness freak so i rate 2 on that right which is ah, okay is good in neatness too now the additive model would have said oh all of this impression 18 plus 2 so now my positive score for this guy is 20 but what averaging model says is that a new positive trait uh, identification in a person can actually reduce the overall impression about that person it's still positive but neat yeah i can't relate much to that so uh, if i average it if you see instead of 20 it goes down to say five for example right it's where whereas in the averaging model you started with the Im person's impression at a six but it dropped so well, that is what averaging model says that when as in when you explore new new positive traits we are only talking about positive not negative here right so you find positive traits in a person Additive said it just keeps wowing you. You just keep getting more and more positive impression of the person. Averaging model says not necessary. Even finding new positive traits in a person can actually overall a positive impression of that person can overall fall for you, right? It can go a little down because you can't relate to that topic, so you you rate that person a little low, right? So this is where people had started in past. So of the two, averaging model has more accurate predictions. Maybe also very evident from from what we what we observe and in our relationships, maybe. But again, uh, applicability of these models are always questioned. First, people are restricted to small finite set of traits when evaluating other people, so which is not really the the the, the sizing of the person. And secondly, the richness of social information is completely neglected in this, right? So it's only about looking about one or two traits and five traits or ten traits at a time. It doesn't really work out, and I have all the other social information is completely neglected. So this is not really good, but it's there as a prior art, and we, everything that has been built up is built up on top of these theories, either by proving them wrong or proving them right, whatever, right? So it's it's all valuable still for us to understand the, the prior art on these topics. So, uh, as it's called out over here, right? So, despite such limitations, research on impression formation has provided important insights into how information about people is processed and combined, right? This was the start. This was this was the basis from where we have started. So, understanding this, even though it is not right, uh, really helps us to understand how it has been evolved into the other other things. Because as I as I mentioned, this is very young science. Even the things that are there now, maybe. Uh, it gets proved wrong, um, or or we add and make it right, right? So we have to understand the thing first. <clears throat> okay, Luchins, I'm sh not sure if I'm pronouncing him right. 1957 started on this topic of inform impression formation. So okay, let's 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 start with a short experiment now, right? And um, feel free to participate in this. Uh, otherwise, I just rush through slides. It's fine. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to tell you a story uh, and then I'm going to ask you something around this. Yeah. OK, so let's start. It's a story of a gym, guy called Jim. Jim walks to school with his five friends. He talks about what he did in the evening before and also talks about what he wants to do as, uh, as plans for the coming evening. He also plans mischiefs uh, that they could do as uh, together um, as a group um after the school right so he's going with his friends planning talking about past uh, talking about the next evening talking about planning his mischiefs etc right this is what jim is let's know more about jim jim is very well mannered usually scores good in his test uh, this is why he is generally favorite of all the teachers right so talks to friends always planning mischiefs always you know, talking uh, very well mannered in school scoring good marks teachers favorite Right? The only complaint about uh, Jim that the teachers have as he never volunteers, he never raises his hand when questions are asked in the class. Uh, Jim does not like to uh, speak in front of the class, even though teacher knows he knows the answer. He just doesn't like doing that. And Jim seldom participates in events that involve going on the stage. Mm -hmm. So now with that story, can anybody tell me what are the say top three things that you remember about Jim now? He's mischievous. He's he mischievous, yes. He keeps silent in the class, and he okay. is intelligent. He knows the answers, and uh, he he does it uh, his studies well. He does his studies well. Perfect. Mischievous does his studies well. Silent in the class. Anybody else? What do you remember out of the story? Give me an overall impression of Jim. Uh, Jim talks only to his friends. Mm -hmm. uh, 
He's silent in the class. He's basically an introvert, but he opens up only with friends. Hmm. Very uh, nice, right? We already we already brought him. I uh, brought an introvert extrovert feeling. Yes. Anybody else? Yeah. He doesn't participate uh, in stage events and all. So. Okay. okay. Perfect. Perfect. He's a good student. He's a good student. Yes. Anybody else? What are the three things you remember about Chip? Doesn't like to socialize. Doesn't like to socialize. Okay. Anybody else? No. Okay. Right. Let's once again look at Jim's story, and and let's please pay attention. This is also also uh, how much can you capture and remember about Jim, right? Let's let's play uh, pay a little closer attention to, right? So Jim walks to the school with his friends. He talks uh, with them about what he did. There's a typo there. Uh, what he did in the evening. He also talks about the next evening plan. He also plans mischief that they could do as a group after the school. Jim is well mannered. Uh, usually scores good in his test. Uh, this is why he is generally the favorite of teachers. Teachers only have one complaint um, about Jim. He is generally very silent in class. He never raises his hand to volunteer for questions. Jim does not like to speak in front of the class, even though teacher know that he knows the answer. Jim seldom participates in events that involves going on the stage in front of the audience. Anybody now? Can can I have two more people trying to summarize what what we know about Jim? Two more points. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing, uh, Jim is a very good leader. He leads, uh, though mm -hmm. he mischievous. And mm -hmm. second thing, uh, uh, um, uh, he is very uh, well mannered. Mm -hmm. Very well mannered. Yes. Uh, he's a he's a favorite amongst teachers. Yes. I think Jamin. He he is a good planner. He's a good planner. Yes. He keeps maybe he's comfortable friends. around his friends maybe uh, talking uh, more comfortable more comfortable around his uh, friends yes yes okay good i think i think i think we are done right so what what i wanted to bring out of this and this is already the title of the uh, topic primacy versus recency effect in in what we gather about a person right what primacy effect says is that uh, it refers to a condition in which early information has stronger impact than the later information, right? For example, uh, Jim is uh, Jim plans mischief. Jim is a good friend. Uh, Jim is well mannered. If you see, more or less, we were getting um, uh, information on that side, right? That that is the primacy effect that was playing on our uh, mind, right? And there are a lot of other games and videos. I just wanted to have a small thing so that we we remember and put it into context. And the second thing is recency effect, in which the later information is given more credence than the earlier information, which means he doesn't like to go on the stage, he's introvert, blah, 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 because the previous ones were giving a little more extrovert kind of uh, impression, right? So he was a leader, for example, somebody said that even though he plans a mischief, he was a leader, a very extrovertial person, tries to take the group along, people, etc., right? Now, how does this change in terms of uh, approaches? So primacy effect generally plays a role. And when does the secondary recency effect come into picture is that second evaluation or post representation. So while we read it the second time, the attention might switch more onto the onto the later parts, relatively larger time span, which I did not do. So larger time span between the presentation of new information. So for example, if I would have now started about okay jim being the uh, friendly and well mannered and then we would have discussed something else and then come back to the next three points the three points about jim would have been much more in our head right so the larger time span also plays an important role and later information is given heavier weight if the task is one which people assume that practice might improve performance that is where i try to say you know guys pay attention this all plays on how good your memory is and how you, it was nothing like that right it's just that um, uh, telling somebody that oh if you if you if you really pay attention um, uh, on everything then as and when if the new information is coming you get more and more attentive because you know you have to remember the previous thing but also try to focus on the present and that inherently uh, makes you focus on the uh, uh, later things more right so these are just the three three approaches which which people claim uh, where recency effect of of information gathering uh, takes more precedence than the primacy effect yeah um 
but because I, I stopped and asked all of you questions. Any any feedback on this? What do you what do you think? Where does it play a role? Have you observed this? Do you agree to this? Any feedback? Give some story while I sip a little bit of my coffee. What's your what's your information gathering, Johner? What do you think? Are you a primacy effect? Are you more prone towards primacy or you are more towards recency? I think I am more towards primacy, like the first information which we came and start building upon that only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, never uh, analyze in that way. Uh, like uh, when this came now, I'm trying to think, but uh, never analyze in that way. But when I think, it's more about the first information came and they start building up on top of that information. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it takes it takes time to uh, change the mindset once in terms of yeah. recency. Like uh, unless a completely stark thing comes into the picture and then I started thinking, no, what I was thinking earlier is a completely different. Is what is the prime? Yeah, so mm -hmm. primary C part is more uh, strong, I think, in, with me. Right, right. I mean, think about it. Why across the globe we talk about one thing which many of us don't agree to, but we talk about one thing which is the first impression always, right? Why, why does it become? Why does it play such an important role, right? So, for example, our WhatsApp group. When we started this WhatsApp group, there was this some admin fellow Jamin. He was just throwing rules and stuff, right? Everybody would have conceived Jamin in a certain way. Right, and that's that's set. Now, even without meeting with that information is set, and everything else that we do that J Jamin does is then uh, viewed from that impression, and it takes time to change for many people, right? And it's much more much common uh, than people saying, "Oh no, let's not defer the prime." My experience tells me that don't refer to the privacy effect, for example. But a very valid point. Anybody else? Anything that you might want to share on this before we uh, proceed? I go with recency effect, uh, especially like uh -huh. starting from basic thing. When I start doing something, I just like go with, okay, what will be the next stage? It is another way. It is not like uh, stages. I just like think yeah. what could be the consequences if we can uh, yeah. see it in a part of it. So in a larger yeah. time span, as you mentioned, so when we go ahead, I just plan it. I just think about what will be the consequences, how it will be, and then I'll get back. Even I can match it up with the, when I start teaching, I'll go through how many pages are there for there, what are the topics, whether it, even if it is a new yes. topic. So I just go yes. through everything, then I'll plan, okay, I can give these type of example, I can talk about these and uh, these many hours it is going to take, so I can plan further for ne my next session, all such type of things. So uh, hardly primacy affected me till now. That's what I mean. Maybe I don't know, but uh, recent. Uh, but even even with respect to people, Arpana. So, uh, ma'am, if I can ask, uh, yes, planning things, yes, one thing. But uh, even having perception about people, do do the recent activities of people um, uh, help you form the impression of the person, or what you have already conceived about the person first? Uh, I would say that uh, like, uh, when it comes to recently, I was working with a task force where we were helping people during this mm -hmm. COVID-19 situation. There were so many people yes. who started approaching me. Okay. So, yes. you know, uh, it might be, it, you might feel creepy. If they start talking to me, I don't know what type of person. I don't want to go with that first impression <laughs> thing that, okay, they told like this, I'll start talking and I will share knowledge right. like this. What I did, I right. just went to their Facebook profile. Um, I have worked in a verification <laughs> company. So I went to their uh, Facebook profile. I understood what they are up to and what type of like sharings they have if it is a public thing. So what type of sharings yeah. they have based on that, where exactly we match so we can take up a particular work together and we can help people. Right, right. I understand. I understand. No, perfectly, perfectly. Yeah. So you, you are more on the recency <laughs> <laughs> Arpana, what do I have on my Facebook profile, Arpana? Do I need to change it? <laughs> no, miss. I understand the way I talk to people, as I said. <laughs> no, all good, all good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so if anybody else has any comments on this, please pitch in. Otherwise, we continue. So I just wanted to do this small exercise, right? Again, two things we understand how it builds still from an editive perspective, because editive or averaging, that is also very interesting to see how you go from if you start with primacy how you go from privacy to recency right uh, is it an additive or averaging approach more often than not it's really averaging uh, approach but many of us might actually have additive approaches right but yeah it all builds on top of each other so yeah interrupt me if anybody wants to give any further comments but let's continue uh, 
um, so schemas and prototypes, right? Again, holding our impressions together. Uh, yeah, I really want to start with that uh, left hand side of the things um, that given the di diversity of people that we have around us, right? Every day, uh, the kind of people we meet, the, the, just just the, um, the variety of things that we have around, uh, just people, right? If not uh, all the other information, it would just overwhelm us. Sheer quantity will overwhelm us, right? Uh, this is where our brains then start um, uh, having schemas and prototypes in place, right? We need to understand that why it is needed and why it is in place. And then we should not fall victim to it, right? For example, we should not typecast or generalize things for a lot of people. So schema, schema schemas are organized bo body of information stored in memory, provides a representation in a way which um, social world operates as well as allowing us to categorize and interpret. For example, automobiles, we know what is the idea of automobiles. So schema of particular people also we form. So one's mother, girlfriend, boyfriend, brother, sister. So, and, and classes of people playing given different roles, right? So mail carriers, teachers, uh, librarians, right? We, we form schemas for all of these information. It just is because our brain capacity is limited. If we don't form the schemas, we will just get overwhelmed and get bogged down, right? But this doesn't mean mean we, we start generalizing and, and uh, uh, use this uh, for judging people, for example. Um, then we come to prototypes. So Nancy Cantor and Walter, 1979, I, I bring up this point Hoping that I can, I do I can never remember it, but hoping this is more academic oriented. Or second um, reason why I put this is you can Google and start looking at these uh, researches, right? So um, prototypes, for example. So now if, again we saw uh, automobiles and other things, but prototypes are even uh, uh, below it. Um, so we have uh, examples like monk, nuns, activists, etc. Right? So now we we have prototypes for these. Um, specific uh, genres, right? So we now say, oh, monks means this is the prototype of it. Uh, what is the more bigger importance of having prototype is? So uh, recall more readily, reorganize and categorize information about others, which is fine. But what happens by if you can do that? So you can organize the social world around us and behavior in social interactions more readily, right? So for example, if we are around monks and nuns, we would behave a little differently. It calls for a certain kind, I mean, we, we can still be what we are, but in that group, we, we might land up doing a little differently. If we are with activists, it's a little different thing. So it already helps us recall oh, well, what, what situation in, am I in? What surrounding am I in? What are the prototypes of people that I am included now with? And, and which means what my behavior should be, right? So it's a very fast, a lot of things happen in our brain to, to uh, diverge even the volume of our speed or how we behave, etc., how we talk. But that is all because we can do schemas and prototyping. And that's the strength of it. The strength of it is not that, oh, this fellow is a monk, so he should be completely holy. He shouldn't, he shouldn't ever laugh too hard or cry too hard. No, that's a wrong. That's judgmental. That is where the cognitive biases and distortions come into play. And that's why understanding why we need schemas and prototypes is important and to make sure that we don't apply it in wrong places is even more important from my perspective. Uh, okay, so we are go we are just about to enter that heavy, heavy topic, heavy topic for me, maybe lighter for others, but it was a little heavy in terms of there was too much content there, too much science there. But before that, any questions, any comments, any real life examples that you want to share with these things, anything that you don't agree, agree, anything. So that I mean, uh, stories and feedbacks always help us remember the study, right? That's that's the more uh, that's the main reason I'm asking the question. Anybody? Uh, the recent example which I can think about prototype is Alok Nath. So mm -hmm. I think uh, Alok Nath <laughs> Babuji. character, yeah, Babuji. Everybody uh, thought him to be a very sanskari, like all the uh, in, like uh, in in all the film serials, uh, he played a very. Uh, Righteous person, and uh, some story came out which was not in line of that. So everybody got yeah. shocked that how come the person who is playing such a righteous person in the movies is uh, yeah. in real life can be in this way. So uh, that was, I think, everybody had a prototype in their mind that uh, on yeah. a screen character and a real life character, nobody would like it's always can be different, as you told about Monk. Yes. Uh, but uh, it, 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 it takes some time to understand that thing. Yes. So, uh, and as you told that is a huge diversity we are in nowadays like we are traveling from one place to mm -hmm. in india so the diversity then out of country so people have prototyping about each other in terms of yes. language and uh, culture yes. religion region so that's the way 
everybody i think experience these things so it's important not to as you told that not to uh, apply it in a wrong way and yes. keep in open mind with everyone absolutely no absolutely i mean but you know babu ji example just because you brought think about that guy you know he actually used that viral sanskari tag for his benefit you know he he got a lot of roles and lot he increased his yeah. price for that tag right yeah, <laughs> and, but yeah. then once he comes out kissing some girl in a disco kind of party with a beer yeah, in the yeah. hat people lost it oh yeah. man what is this right on yeah. on the other other side similar example is with this ramayan actor right he went into Ar- Arun, depression Arun Govind. yeah Arun Govind. he went into depression because after ramayan was over the uh, whenever he went into uh, to somebody else for a role first of all they used to get up as if real ram has yeah. come right and then how can yeah. we give you role right and this fellow is like lost it how, how can i ever succeed again in my life right so yeah same 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 thing on this arun govil uh, i was just a few days back there was an interview uh-huh. he was telling that uh, on sets of ramayan only once the sh- on ramayan or some other movie he was doing uh-huh. and as uh-huh. soon as he completed the uh, shot he moved out and he was having some cigarette okay yeah. somebody just saw or he oh. was working in some certain <laughs> movie somebody just saw and he started shouting we consider you like lord and you ram and you are yes. having cigarette and he thought oh my god what i have done he told that i <laughs> i left uh, like i quit smoking at that point of time i didn't smoke after that but that was a, like uh, what is happening i cannot smoke also so that's the yes. uh, prototyping yes yes now we, yeah agreed right so again we need to understand the need that we need schemas and prototypes so that we don't overwhelm but using it in a wrong context is the biggest and the most common thing we all do right so it's it's our all mistake for sure perfect thank you for sharing that anybody else any example before we proceed no perfect let's go we are doing very good on time um okay my presentation is stuck okay so attribution uh, explaining the causes of behavior and we we come to that ram topic uh, with cigarette because it has some applicability in in one of the examples in this theory also so hyder 1958 he is the first to started then but then weiner and colleagues all of that eh? johns weiner all of them started to develop a theoretical framework that has a major research paradigm on social psychology especially around around students uh, how how to deal with students how to motivate them so all the, all about the campus life etc uh there this this attribution uh, theory is is of a very very big impact yeah and again it's very new still uh, even though it has started in 58 72 it still has barely scratched the surface um at a high level right but it's being being uh, from 1958 until now if we say it's barely scratched the surface which means nobody has really proved it wrong it's it's developing on top of the attribution theory right unless catharsis for which i had shared example in between something as as um, late as 2002 it was proved that you no know, the catharsis approach is really not not the right approach it it feels very intuitive but it's wrong but i mean we don't go there uh, we continue with attribution part so and here um, let me be very honest i'll try and cover the the concept at overall that i have understood but if you and that will help from an academic standpoint also and some things that we remember and use in our life but that there is a lot more content behind all of this right it demand it it cannot be done in one hour one and a half hour or that one unit of of our book it it is a very huge topic in its own demands a lot of research work study a lot of other external book study etc yeah so with that as context let's continue so the attribution right so we have the first one which is situational versus dispositional causes so how would you where what would you put the cause towards would you say it's a situational cause or whether it's a dispositional cause again it's more like internal and external and we will look at the example of this but this is the first uh, first uh, theme of attribution where we say if something happens where do we put the cause to right do we put the cause to dispositional or do we say it is situational right that has its impact so it's internal versus external uh, covariate principle this is again very powerful so kelly suggested that um, so there are I'm, i'm not going into the too much of verbos here uh, the, the th- second and the third point and we'll again look at a matrix to try and remember it simply so from a from a from a observer perspective the cause gets divided into three parts so either the actor did it the entity on which it happened is the reason um, or the circumstance so which which from which which angle do you want to look at it right so the actor the entity the circumstance and then uh, validating our judgment about it uh, about the attribution 
we also have three uh, aspects to that consensus so maybe if everybody's talking about it it is like that right it, it reinforces consistency which means if i see that happening again by the same person in the similar situation or same entity in the similar situation it's consistent and distinctiveness right how how distinctive it is in terms of black and white so in, in one situation this fellow is very calm uh, so in generally he's not an angry fellow but here he became very angry which means now my observation of attributing the situation for his anger is 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 helping me so more more distinctive scale helps validate this scenario even more right so that's a covariate principle the third principle that we have is acts of disposition so edward goner and keith davis in 1965 they started it to make inferences about so this is this this um okay let me read it so make inferences about his personality and motivations behind his behavior so personality and motivation is put together uh, for x uh, to disposition and according to jones and davis we learn that most uh, from behaviors of others that lead to non-common effects right so uh, whenever there is a really uncommon outcome from from the behaviors that is when we learn the most right if it is expected if it is common behavior we really don't make an impression but if something out of the blue very uncommon uh, effect happens then we uh, look at it and also from a social desirability perspective we look at it whether the outcome was really socially desirable or not so that is where we start um put connecting the x to disposition again we will look at it all three of them a little better if you read in the book at least i was very very confused um the language and all of it put together i couldn't really gather what they were trying to say right but it uh, later parts of the book mm, unveils it also a little more so for example uh, maria's car breaks down uh, on a freeway now if she believes that the breakdown happened because of her ignorance about cars she is making an internal attribution right and if she believes that the breakdown happened because her car is old she is making an external attribution right so this is the difference that we have in internal and external uh, attribution approach right from covariate principle this may this matrix this is picked from our book and it's very strong i think it helps us remember a lot of things so attribution um, we have uh, in three terms so at an object level an entity level or a circumstance level right and then uh, how do we reinforce right so information patterns uh, the way we re receive this information and see it, it reinforces it. So, but at an object level, if there is consensus, if it is distinctive, it is consistent for all of that thing, it just reinforces very, very high. But if it is a, about a particular entity in question, the consensus and distinctiveness doesn't really matter. The consistency, um, how often that entity behaves this way when a particular situation happens, that is of more important for attribution for the entity. And attribution for circumstances is again from a distinctiveness, right? So uh, it really has to have a distinctive difference in the outcome in that circumstance compared to all the other circumstances. Then the attribution is now looked at from a circumstance perspective. Oh, it was highway. That is why the car got uh, told, right? Or car, car, car was totaled, for example, or whatever. Car got punctured, or whatever, breakdown, right? So it's it's more of uh, from a circumstance is, is only looked from an attribution more strongly when it is very, very distinctive in its approach. Um, then going ahead, why is my, okay. So uh, here is where we have the difference between the uh, Jones and Davis theory versus the Kelly's uh, covariate principle uh, that we looked about, right? And, and neither of them uh, actually can completely support. What Jones and Davis does is they do it a little differently, which means they have, for example, so let's, the Jones and Davis theory considers a somewhat different aspect to the Kelly's causal attribution that we saw. So uh, Kelly's model focuses on general direction, right, of drawing the explanations, all of those above. We see these three things based on the information pattern, we attribute it to one or the other based on where the attribution seems to be high, right? That is what it sees uh, in general, Kelly, right? Jones and Davis theory, what it does is, it corresponds inference provide, uh, provides identification of a particular characteristic trait that underlies behavior when dispositional attribute is made. So what it tries to do is, it, it doesn't go at a generic level. It tries to infer 
the uh, outcome based on the particular characteristics and traits that underlie so if it is about Mar uh, maria's car breakdown scenario right it would look at maria's underlying attribution of the maria of maria's mindset itself of the car itself and etc right so it goes down at underlying characters but if you look at individualistic situational underlying characteristics that cannot be formed as a theory so then it is not giving me uh, an approach of consistency across the time to gather the information and do an hypothesis, which Kelly's theory gives, right? So uh, any of that put in isolation, see at that point in time, they figured out cannot work, right? So we have to do it together, right? For example, we have to put the Jones and Davis uh, theory around behaviors of non-common effects, uh, social desirability, all of that put together. That is more going in depth of that particular item versus uh, covariate principle of these uh, three by three matrix on where the attribution uh, may land up eventually, right? That is more time independent or, or consistency as, as we go ahead and, and forms a pattern for us, right? So those are the two things that we try to put together in the attribution theory. And this is just the start of the attribution theory on what prior art and what other people are talking about it. In the next slides, we will talk a little more about uh, how this is being applied, uh, where all can we have errors, uh, how it is being used for uh, understanding even self, right? All of those starts, the applicability starts in the later few slides. Okay, so I think I will continue on this. Errors in attribution. So the fundamental uh, error in attribution, right? Uh, uh, whatever the sentence mean, I'll give you an example. So when I see somebody, uh, two people talking, right, and and they are, they are, uh, the one there is one person who is really laughing, enjoying, is paying full attention to the other person's word, um, giving back the responses, back channel feedbacks are very good, confident in the pitch of sound, body language, all of it. So I think that person is extrovert, very confident uh, person, right? But now imagine I am that person and somebody is making imp uh, impression about me saying, ah, Jamin always speaks nicely, gives responses, is very confident. He doesn't uh, care, uh, uh, worry about saying no's, uh, right? He would, he would deny, he would take a stand, etc. right? Uh, I, on the other hand, may say that, no, I was doing that with that person because that person was very friendly. That person was actually gave me a very comfortable zone to be myself. I'm not like this with everybody. You know what I mean? So when we rate the other person versus when we rate our own self, there is a difference, right? And that is where the, the fundamental attribution error happens because now we are attributing to the personality, the causality of that person's behavior, et cetera, distinctive, blah, 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 from all of the slides we see. But when we rate somebody versus somebody rates themselves, there is a huge difference. Right? People might say, oh, he's confident. He might say, uh, no, I, I, I'm not always confident. The group in which I was is so friendly and so comfortable that I could be myself. And that was the reason for me being um, confident. Yeah. So that is one of the fundamental attribution error and the hello effect, right? Assuming consistency in a person. So friendly and clear headed. I know a person is friendly, he's clear headed, which means he must be helpful and sociable. Not necessarily. You know, not necessarily, right? I mean, he plays the role of Ram doesn't mean he should not have cigarettes, right? But we do this. We build up an hello effect in our heads based on the primacy, recency, whatever effects we have. We then start connecting dot, right? Only because he speaks good English, he must be very knowledgeable. No, he can be the dumbest person on the earth, right? Just speaking good English is not a qualification of knowledge, right? Um, similarly, a degree from many B schools, for example. But yeah. So this is these are the fundamental errors of of um, of of uh, attribution that we land up having. Uh, main thing what they try to tell over here is that they picture a human being as thoughtful and systematic processor of information, right? Whereas on the other hand, people are distinctive. They they are distinctiveness psychologists. Uh, that Fris uh, Hyder describes is sus uh, susceptible to error, right? So distinctiveness psychologist is more about these errors that we talk about that we are all very distinctiveness psychology. We distinct, that there's a distinctive approach in our psychologist self when we try to rate, for example, the attribution, right? We are not a systematic processor of information. 
if I were a systematic processor of information, the way I would look at others, uh, talking in friendly situation, for example, I would rate myself same even in my situation. I would not have difference in that. So I'm not, I'm not a, as a human being, I'm not a systematic processor of information in terms of uh, attribution only, right? We are only talking in, in the compass and in the premise of attribution. Uh, this was this slide for me was a very powerful thing, um, not not from an academic standpoint, but from from analyzing and understanding a lot of things of, that I do personally um, and where I go wrong and with real life examples, etc. So I would want to stop here, take this opportunity to ask anybody uh, want to add from their personal experiences anything around this that they would have seen, learned, observed with the group so that we all can again remember this more concretely before that a question am i audible are we still here yeah yeah you are okay anybody anything on this at least stop me if i'm going fast anywhere or whatever yeah just just let me know well, I think that uh, I just uh, I'm not sure uh, it is just related to this, but uh, attribution error. I'll I'll talk uh, from my uh, kids' perspective. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. attribution is like uh, uh, the way we see people and the way we try to imagine. This is the way, like you told that, uh, not always English-speaking people are uh, uh, good learners, and and same that's true with vice versa also. Sure. Uh, but, uh, same way like uh, i just observed is my kid like uh, my wife left job uh, when we had a second kid and my daughter started thinking that mommy always works at home and papa always works in office mm -hmm. and uh, she started uh, attributing the importance of a different job to different way like uh, my job is to go outside earn money and um, my wife's job is to stay at home and then make cook food and all those things so yeah she started she started attributing that thing uh, to uh, male and female sense and then she, she mm -hmm. herself is a female uh, herself mm -hmm. a female so uh, like uh, she started thinking okay uh, uh, like this is the way i only i can grow up and so i st needed to show her her a lot of role models in who are yeah. female who is working both the things like or not both the things like some of my friends who are like in police or uh, like in mm -hmm. different fields i started trying to uh, meet her to different different kind of ladies who are in different different fields yeah. uh, other, otherwise she was started making that uh, uh, mindset to know my as a female my job is this as a male this is the job so yeah. um, that's how i relate this attribution it is attribution error but that's what since in her environment this is the only thing she was looking at when she was growing up right. and uh, yeah. uh, so that's what uh, the mindset she was uh, having so um, mm -hmm. i, I I know I always try to find out wherever I see a lady role model or a female yeah. who is doing good in any field, like it's a chess, police, anywhere, mm. like in my office, everywhere I just, because my wife is there as one role model, but a number of role models are there. So she should yes. have a, that diversity in her views and then make a decision. So that's, yes. that's yes. I think. Yes, I am mean, a beautiful example of an hello effect, right? So a, a female yeah. working home, uh, which means she cannot work outside, right? That's the that's the continuation that we make in our head. For example, maybe the kid makes yeah, it. Yeah, right? so absolutely. we have to make sure that the observed attribute does not necessarily mean the derived attribute, right? And that is what we have to see it also from the positive angle and see it from the from the uh, negative angle both, right? So yeah, I mean, why kids? We all do it, right? So that's that's something. But understanding that we are doing it, the hello effect. Uh, in in itself is is something uh, awesome yeah so for example if 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 i i am i help sometimes people uh, with with my cognitive behavioral therapy approach etc so people would think that oh because he he is trying to do therapy and he's trying to say how how to control the emotion uh, he himself must be a very cool guy right very very uh, in control of things and no right and as i always tell people i'm i'm my first patient for example so it's, it's not really, for example, doctors, oh, they should always be healthy. They, they should not fall in. <laughs> that doesn't work that way, for example. So things like that. So there is definitely errors in attribution. 
Thank you, Siddharth. So anybody else, any example, any anything that you want to say, contest in, in whatever we discussed so far? Otherwise, we move on. Perfect. Uh, again, feel free to interrupt me wherever you want to pitch in and give any examples of it. Okay. So let's continue. Errors in attribution we covered. Uh, now we talk about the positive uh, positivity bias, looking for good in others. Um, uh, for me, this was counterintuitive, right? Because what I, I see is people actually start, the news sells bad things, right? News are the sellers of the bad. Only, they only have TRP if they sell bad news. There was a channel in UK some years back, they started showing good news. What, do you know what happened with it? It crashed. They, they did not get TRPs. They did not, they had to shut down, right? So they used to always share good news. Oh, this is the good thing happened here. Here is the donation that happened. Oh, the koala bear was on verge of extinction. It gave a birth to two new babies and blah, blah, blah. They used to always talk about good things. People stopped watching it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, this was a little counterintuitive uh, to me, but I understand the context. It is not at a overall, but it's trying to look and make the current situation and surrounding good. And which means in current situation, if there is something bad, which cannot be removed, we try to justify and make, make it look good, uh, good for our sanity's uh, sake, right? So that was a very interesting learning for me on this. So, but if you, if you look at it, uh, yeah, the examination of student ratings of instructors show that colleague professors receive more favorable ratings as individuals. Then when they are rated in groups, and college professors are rated uh, more highly than the course they teach itself, right? Now, this is generally a trend across. If you ask somebody to rate one person, right? Most of the time, the uh, feedback will come good. If you try and tell, oh, let's rate all the um, ex genre teachers, the, the response might be less. And, and the most funny part happens in most, of, in, in, even in a corporate training, when I take some trainings, et cetera, what happens is they rate the trainer very high. They rate the course bad. <laughs> so, I mean, it, the course is bad if the trainer couldn't convey the message properly, right? And and so, but I mean, there is a bias. What it means is, again, the positivity bias, right? Uh, so Pollyanna principle operates to color out our perceptions. And we'll talk about it a little more. Um, assumptions of similarity. So as we have indicated, people not only rate in general positive way, but they tend to assume that the others are in, uh, are similar to themselves this predisposition is known as assumed similarity bias. Uh, uh, I don't know how many of you watch this uh, mind games that come, I think, on Discovery or National Geography. I think it's National Geography, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there was a very beautiful um, episode where, you know, they what they did is they had a person carry uh, a, something hidden in a in a in a in a brown paper bag and collapse in between of a very busy street. Uh, in one situation, as soon as he collapsed, everybody came to help so much so that there was, I think there was a, there was a lady with a child, even she ran and tried and grabbed him and had tried to help him and hey, what is happening, etc. You know, the same person, same paperback comes and crashes in the same place. Of course, different people now. Uh, he gets ignored for one hour. Nobody Nobody helps him. Can you guess what the difference was and why this happened? Uh, race, probably. Mm -hmm. sorry, uh, sorry. Is it something racial? It, it, it's it's a little more than racial, right? So dress, I think you, that is what you said. If if you say that initially, a little more than racial. Racial is a sub part of it. I mean, in the previous one, he was dressed very nicely. He had blazer. He, he had a, a dress sense which was a little higher than the dress sense of the uh, crowd that he was part of. Um, but very similar approach, right? In the other thing, he was dressed like a homeless fellow, you know. This difference, and they couldn't see anything what is in the bottle. Nobody could see what is in the bottle, uh, or sorry, in the in the white paper bag that that looked it looked like a bottle. Nobody knew it. In first case, maybe they thought it was some medication that he was taking. In other, maybe people thought he was drunk. Which means, from a similarity bias perspective, people could not find a similarity with that guy. They didn't help him at all, right? And then when they could find similarity, they jumped on the gun to help him. Right, and this, this again, uh, many people thought that it could be gender based, right? But it was gender neutral. So same experiment was followed up with a with a lady, right? Uh, and it was exactly the same outcome. 
So when they were dressed to a similar surrounding, when people could feel, oh, this is somebody like us in trouble, let me help him. Oh, it's not in my, um, as I like to call tribe, right? I mean, the nations today and this thing is just an expansion of what primitive days tribes were. But if it is not of my tribe, I would don't, don't want to go. I don't know what it is. I want to stay away. I want to turn my children away from there for sure, right? For example. So this is where the similarity bias plays a role. And but the good part is, according to this theory, that we try to uh, look into look in similarity uh, with people around, which means if we have somebody not too similar living besides us as a neighbor and there is no no escaping from there, uh, maybe in a few years we will start looking at some similarity in our heads with that person or, or that family and then try in our head try and color that um, differences to, so that we say same, right? We, we like to have a positive bias of our surrounding. Uh, if we can't change, we, we color it, color the fact itself saying, oh, this is like us. There is something common between us, right? So that's a, that's a very interesting and a powerful bias that is working in our heads continuously. So Pollyanna principle operates to color out perceptions. Uh, my PPT again is a little, okay. So according to this view, we enjoy being surrounded by pleasant world. And thus, we hope a, a, a propensity to view people uh, through rose-colored glasses, which means we just want to look, try and make things look everything pretty even uh, around us, right? And so we really look it through colored glass, which means we even color the fact, um, make it look all good around us, right? So that is what we uh, go towards. That is what our our uh, impulses are, right? I mean, uh, from a Freud. Uh, Freud um, um, psychotherapist perspective i mean this is playing still at the so, uh, subconscious level id level right so id ego um, super ego of freud we will touch upon that if you want later it comes in our subjects also in in, in personality of theory uh, personalities i guess but that is where where uh, this plays it really plays at a very subconscious preconscious level uh, that we try to do these things um yeah, any, anybody wants to share anything on this? Do you agree? Do you don't agree? Any examples that you want to put before we proceed? Okay, perfect. Let's move on. Um, attribution theory and its applicability in education. So attribution theory, Weiner, 1980 to, until 1980, 1992 is probably the most influential theory with implications on academic motivation. It emphasizes the idea that learners are strongly motivated by pleasant outcomes of being able to feel good about themselves. Right. And this has very, very nice, uh, nice psychological aspects into it. We will, we will touch upon it as we proceed. Right. So according to the attribution theory, the explanations that people tend to make to explain their success or failures can be analyzed in terms of three sets of characteristics. And this is all now becoming very, very um, pragmatic, scientific. You can see it in action, and especially in education world, right? Or training world in corporate. So uh, it's, it's all mental, right? As the cognitive behavioral says, it's not about the outcome. It's not really about success and failure, but how you explain the success and failure that matters completely. It's never the real success and failure. It's, it's how, how and what you use to explain one's own success and failure that changes the entire gamut of, of how you approach, what's our, what are your motivation factors, what are your next steps, right? So as a, as a cognitive uh, person, it, it really excites me. So one is, again, the same thing that we addressed before, a little bit of internal and external. So attributed to an external cause when the reasons are more likely or possible. Uh, plausible, right? So, which means uh, bad luck, right? Or oh, the paper was too hard. I can never study about it. Or attribute uh, to dispositional factor where external causes are unlikely. Right? No, everybody passed. So maybe I should have worked hard. It's it's my stuff, for example. Or Jamin, it's you're trying to go into uh, a sub uh, a, a master's program where you have to write all of this stuff. You can't write more than two full skip, and that's not even 15 marks. How are you going to clear exam, right? I mean. Either I put it that way and it becomes external or Jamin, everybody's doing it. You need to start writing now. You need to get into a habit of academic if you want to try and pass out this exam. So that's more of internal. So let me start practicing. Let's start um, uh, improving. 
stable versus uh, unstable so if stable uh, more likely the same outcome so whether whether we say um, this is more on the catastrophic mindset approach right so we say that uh, no this is how it's going to be i can never write more than two two full scripts to paper it's just not time jay when you're too old now for this right and it cannot change that's a stable approach from my side unstable is no come on i've written so many things in past it's not too yeah come on it's not you're not too old yet right so unstable can can it be changed right that is a that is the explanation that we can put to a failure or a success both of it right and controlled and uncontrolled so uh, can be controlled easily so for example can i work hard for example internal in internal it will be controllable is work hard um in, in uncontrollable would be for example i am an introvert person full stop i cannot change it it's my core nature i can't control it right which means something that requires extrovert approach in jobs maybe they don't suit for me so that's uncontrolled internal aspect right so internal also can have controllable and uncontrollable external also can have controllable and uncontrollable um, explanation so external for example taking previous easier course yeah masters maybe not let me start with bachelor i took up too much to chew right it's an external thing but i can control it which means let me go to an easier course uncontrollable would be uh, abstracted uh, will stay abstracted so my mindset the kind of person the kind of thinking i do is always abstracted but uh, you know this course does not this is statistics how can i do abstract in statistics i have to go at a non abstracted detail level and do it which means statistics is or maths is maybe never for me right so this is an uncontrolled outside state so control and uncontrolled works for internal and external both right uh do i have anything here as an important assumption of attribution theory is that people will interpret their environment in such a way to maintain a positive self image that is they will attribute their success or failures to factor that will enable them to feel as good as possible about themselves now this is such a for me personally this is such a powerful line right that success or failure the kind of explanations that people seek or attempt by default unless they have hit a point of no return where they say oh it's learned helplessness and we will touch that topic soon in one of the slides but basic assumption is that even if i fail the explanation that i'm coming up with or at least wanting to come up with is that makes me as good as possible even in that failure yeah so but um, again for me it was a very aha moment when i when i read that statement so i put there but anybody wants to share anything especially arpana ma'am from from your students experience anything that you would want to share on this especially trying to feel as good as possible in failure right coming up with explanation in failure to try and feel as good as possible if you can share something around that uh, to the group from your experience i think it will be very enriching am i still there okay maybe there maybe not there maybe not interested anybody else want to add anything on this before we proceed perfect we go let's continue i'm uh, audible right sorry my mom is not well i just am with her right no now. no no problem okay. yeah yeah no I'll no problem send message all, all good. So i'll be back i'll be back in 10 15 minutes what no no problem at all yeah yeah sure no problem okay i think if anybody uh, going good please continue shweta thank you so i am not able to see the chat again right so but let me continue so again um, okay it was only a wow moment for me but let me reinforce right uh, they will attribute their successes or failures to factor that will enable them to feel as good as possible about themselves let's be very clear so if somebody is coming your even you yourself are coming to your you yourself as a patient or somebody else whom you want to help a friend right even in their failure let's be very clear the explanation that they are seeking by default is the explanation that makes them feel good are yaar hard luck are paper bahut kharab tha right you couldn't do anything and stuff like that or you you are a rock star man next time you will hear it for example right they say ha ah, yeah or you say, oh, you know, all of us have failed um, the three idiot story right a friend also failed i feel better for example <laughs> things like that so everybody is striving towards feeling as good as possible in every outcome yeah. Yeah, so one one example i just like to share here uh, it's a, i think it's last year one of my friend he bought uh, that uh, ardan pot like matka where we we used to store uh, for uh, water uh, 
okay so he yeah, bought yeah. for around uh, 300 or 400 rupees okay and uh, then uh, he bought somewhere from the roadside only 400 rupees and then after some time uh, after some day he found that it is being sold at 150 rupees only <laughs> He was very disheartened at AR uh, 250 rupees. I was like just looted. Mm -hmm. So he was just telling me, I told him, don't worry. Uh, you think only that uh, you gave it to that uh, uh, poor uh, potter itself. Yeah. Like uh, he's selling at a uh, road, you just donated it for 250 rupees. Then he started, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah you're right. I didn't think uh -huh. in that. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was feeling very bad that I lost 250 rupees. Now I don't <laughs> think yeah, yeah. it's a poor man. He got the 250 rupees from me. Because that's the way just to, you know, attribute is change and uh, he started feeling better about that. So. Yes, the, the, the dissonance, the conflict suddenly goes away, right? Uh -huh, I'm happy. I did it for good. I'm feeling happy. Even though I lost 250, now I'm feeling good yeah. about it. Exactly. Beautiful example. Beautiful example. Perfect. Okay. Uh, again, anybody else, if you want to pitch in, please interrupt me. Let's continue. So, four factors related to attribution theory that influences motivation in education, right? That is, this is one place where attribution theory is very strongly used, but it's, it, it has applicability outside. So, ability, right, is relatively internal and stable factor over which the learner does not exercise much direct control. I mean, it's, it's my ability, right? um to 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 study for example the task diffi uh, difficulty so is an external and stable factor that is largely beyond learners control for example mm -hmm. effort is an internal and unstable factor uh which the learner can exercise a great deal of control i can i can define how much effort i want to put on this topic right and we talk about effort versus uh, effective effort versus hard work, especially in education, right? It, that's a very nice analogy. It'll come up later. And and luck, right, is an external um, and unstable factor over which learner exercises very li little control. So uh, two days before the exam, I read five things. All five of them came in exam. I passed. Or I just left two chapters, and most of the uh, questions came from those two chapters. Now that was a bad luck. I don't have control over it. So uh, a person's own perception or attributions of success or failure determine the amount of effort the person will expend on the activity in future, right? Specifically from education. Now we learned that uh, from failure and success, attributing the explanations and uh, will define the, the, the state of happiness and conflict, but generally a person would try to go, a student would try to go towards the state of happiness in the explanation. And that explanation, whether uh, the stable versus unstable, all of the above that we saw in the in the previous slide, uh, combined with all of these four things, this explanation now would directly affect the motivation of the student and how much the student is ready to put effort in the next step. Right? Pretty clear. Let's go to the next slide. So, attribution theory for students' persistent effort. Right? So, student will be more persistent at academic task under the following circumstances. So attributing their academic success to internal unstable factors over which they have control, right? Effort, for example, it's unstable. It is internal. I have control on it. I can change it. Internal stable factors over which they have little control, but which may sometimes be disrupted by other factors, right? So ability disrupted by occasional bad luck. Now, bad luck is something that they don't have control on but if it's occasional and i know i still have ability i'm fine right then attributing their failures to unstable uh, factors on which they have control which is effort so i feel i did not give enough time if i put more time i'll pass attribute failure to lack of appropriate effort so can still succeed if they give their best shot now teachers say that but I, I put a warning over there. This is this is this is a tricky situation, and we'll see why in the next point, right? So, oh, you give your best shot, you will you will pass. Can anybody think what what that? Why I put warning over there? What could be the next problem of, of this approach? You know, a person fails, and you say, no, you give it your best shot, uh, and, and you can succeed. Uh, it, forget exams in general in life, right? Give it your best shot, you will succeed. If we reinforce that into a person, what are the risks that we are doing with this? Anybody can think of something over here? What is the risk of such attitude or such guidance coaching to a person? So I think the uh, emphasis should be more on the effort rather than the uh, like a, 
the effort means the work the person is doing rather than uh, factors mm-hmm. like you g- give the best shot what is the best shot if i also don't know what he gave okay i just to make him or her happy i'm saying no you give the best shot you do it best or rather mm-hmm. telling him to know you should put this much effort or you put that much effort you will definitely do better uh, okay so but let's let's more. also consider that you put 10 hours and you will clear your examination right let's let's even come yeah. down to that level let's let's remove the ambiguity of best right so I, let's let's look at it a person you put these many hours and you will pass what is the danger of saying this to somebody it's the same thing still Danger means it, it, you are setting up a limit for the person that 10 hours or 8 hours or the best shot, what is the best shot he, he, he has himself in his mind. And that is the limit he's, you are setting up for the, the person. Like, okay, 8 hours I'm doing and I'll, I'll do good. Like, okay. So that's how I think sure. that, is. that is. That is definitely one, one side of the angle. Can you turn the, a 360 degree angle and look at it? What, what could go wrong? Let's see, you, you told Jamin. You study, you give it your best shot, you're good, you study, you will clear this subject, right? I, I, Jamin appeared in December, failed in three subjects. Now I'm thinking of giving up MAPC. But you tell <laughs> Siddharth, tell Jamin, no, Jamin, don't worry, man, you have done MBA also, so you can do it, give it your best shot, try breaking up, do this much, and you will pass. What could be the outcome? What are the possible outcomes of this, right? Either I pass or I fail again. Yeah. Right? Now, if I fail again, what are you going to tell me? You will tell me, Jamin, no, come on, give one more chance. Okay. Oh, now, yeah. So in that, whether I pass or that, I fail, again so I fail. In that case, oh, in that case, if uh, once uh, giving the back shot, I tell that you give the back shot, uh, still you fail, then you start, uh, you, st- you stop uh, listening to the person's yeah. advice whether the best shot will work yes. or not. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So now, now you know, it becomes. Ex- extremely hazardous to mental motivational health we are, we are speaking here at motivation so we'll stick to motivational health it is it is hazardous extremely hazardous to motivational health if you have repeated failures with great efforts as you said yeah. effort effort does not mean i've studied effectively just sitting and studying uh, 12 hours a day is not not the right approach maybe right it's not about the quantity of effort it's quality of effort for example right so we may stop believing that we are competent or to st- stop the attributing their failure to lack of effort. So I said, no, it's not about effort, man. I gave it all. I'm tired, man. Then I just can't do this. I'm done. I'll never do this again. Right? So uh, when we set examples or give uh, explain ourselves, our successes and failures, or especially failure, or we explain or motivate somebody else who has failed, we have to be extremely careful in, in telling, you know, give great efforts next and you will clear no but if they fail continuously and that is again learner helplessness will come in the next slide maybe uh, it, it can be extremely hazardous that, that's like a point of no return right our motivation levels will drop so down it will be almost impossible to come out of it later yeah so that's one very very important aspect uh, then there are out apart from this from a, from our curriculum perspective right so define effort correctly what is what do we mean by effort right as we discussed work hard or improve effort so work hard is not really doesn't matter right i mean don't study 12 hours study two hours but improve effort how can you best summarize things abstract things look at the comp blah 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 whatever it means right um uh, then there is excessively competitive and grading evaluation system this also puts the motivation very down for students uh, and evaluate students at least partly uh, but not excessively based um, on basis of their effort which which actually helps increase their motivation to be honest right so if you for example what mapc is doing if you see what mapc is doing with the assignments why are they giving us gradation on assignments they, uh, they all know that doing assignment doesn't mean we acquired knowledge but what they're doing is they are actually giving us or partially evaluating us based on the efforts we are putting right which is very very significant and when i read that line i, I really got a little newfound respect for how, how MAPC is structured with assignment approach and examination approach, right? Because examination is purely competitive grading evaluation, but uh, the later part is also uh, giving emphasis to efforts, which means, oh, I, I put in an effort, at least I put so many hours, I finished my uh, assignment, um, I, I did I did put so many hours, now I fail in the exam or I don't score, score good in the exam, but that effort has been evaluated by MAPC, and for that I get marks, right, even partially. So that that combined maybe I pass. So that is a beautiful thing. And then internal locus of control, right? Oh, that is the entire uh, internal looking 
of what all things are there in our control and what are not. So yeah, that is where, uh, apart from a lot of grammatical and language corrections, which I had to do when I pulled content from that slide to here and still not good <laughs> I, uh, with, with that uh, item on, on evaluating students based on effort, um, that I had a very newfound uh, respect for how MAPC is really, really structured because none of the other masters are structured like that, at least from what I have experienced. Yeah, tell me, somebody was. Yeah, one thing I would like to sh yeah one thing I would like to share here like I was also reading in terms of uh, education and how uh, kids get motivated and the way what what what, it, what should be the way we, we should uh, appreciate them and I found a very good uh, literature at one place like we should motivate them basis on the effort not basis of yes. their intelligence yes. uh, intelligence they are showing in cert doing certain tasks rather than the effort which they are putting in doing certain tasks yes. that should be appreciated in longer run that will re reap the better fruit. Yes. than the intelligence. What happens yes. if we start motivating people like our kids based on their intelligence? Okay, you are very intelligent. You did this thing very quickly. Okay, so they uh, in longer run they start uh, doing things to show their intelligence rather than completing this stuff or getting the right outcome. Okay, but if we are motivating or appreciating them based on their effort, okay, you have put a great effort, two hours, three hours, whatever yes. the effort you did the yes. thing, then they start picking up that thing and they start putting up more effort to complete the task rather than showing up their intelligence and putting doing it quickly yes. and quickly again. Yes. And longer yes. run, I'm now help. more oriented rather than effort, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So intelligence, everybody has got certain gift in terms of intelligence, but the effort that should be appreciated more rather than, okay, you are very intelligent, your mind is very sharp and this and that, that, that longer and it doesn't work uh, in a in a positive sense. But if someone yeah. is being told that, okay, your effort, you are putting great effort and all these things, then he will, he or she will get motivated more to do more. Yes. yes. Okay, basically with my experience, what I have seen in kids, there are two kinds of kids we mm -hmm. so, yeah, till like uh, graduation level, I have seen this one kind of people, they mug up, They'll go on just retamaro and they'll write it and they'll get better mass. And there is a bad luck with uh, the people who are with lots and lots of effort and they'll go right. They won't get the expected marks. So it is not like bad luck or anything, but they will come to a certain stage where, okay, every time I write, I start comparing with like another person. That person is gaining knowledge in the form of like, it is temporary knowledge. Okay, I mugged up, I wrote it and I came back. Next day, if you ask, there is nothing in the brain. Whereas the person who has really put lots and lots of effort to understand the concept slowly going in depth and all, they remember it forever. But they are unable to implement in the paper because they have to like uh, dig it up from the subconscious mind and they have to write it. Maybe the keywords they use it, there will be a kind of different uh, thing. Effort they have put uh, as well as like another person has put to sit and mug up whole thing, whole textbook throughout the day. Effort is there in both the way that success factor be, like depends on how you are going to implement in a particular situation. So repeated right. failure, it is common in case of UPSC exam and CA exam, ICW exams. Mm -hmm. So those people, they keep on writing. Most of them they motivate themselves in such a day that they keep on writing throughout their life. So people, <laughs> they, those are people like self-motivated on because they, I think they have certain type of financial support or parental support or, until unless they reach certain level, they don't want to quit that. So uh, considering this, the attribute depends like self-motivated person or uh, effort is different and ultimately as uh, we heard just now it is all about how we motivate the kid it's okay it is not the end you gain knowledge and you will be the topper one day yeah yeah because knowledge is the one when you are operating on someone you will become doctor both the ways like you will mug up all medical terminologies and you will go to a particular position and a person who really gain knowledge when they are into a crisis the creativity of the person will work more when they have knowledge when they have analyzed the situation practically within their like mind in fact so that's what i believe true true, true. absolutely absolutely um, the flip side of this is attributing uh, something positive with a failure is this might maybe in few cases lead to uh, a behavioral trait which in long term always uses excuses 
for their failures. Failure. Even that yeah. might be possible. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. A very valid point, right? So what, what we yeah. are actually looking here is that how how the student can persist there. That is what we are looking. So if if uh, for and and we looked at the uncontrolled and controlled uh, explanations, uh, uh, Harishi, right? So if the explanation goes wrong for the failure, that starts becoming an excuse, and then the persistent effort would go away. Yeah, absolutely, a point. It has a side effect, right? That that's that's what you're saying, Harishi. Yeah. Yes, Jim. Mm, right. I mean, in in that previous slide, we had that right where where we have uh, wrong um explanations to failure so that yeah. is where we have to be very careful for example here if you see for efforts all of these failure things if you see right so attributing yeah. the failure to unstable but controllable which means i'm attributing my failure to my effort now i can't use the excuse oh i don't put effort so i fail <laughs> right I, I i have to put more effort but if you say oh the, you fail because it was hard luck here the paper itself is bad it always stays so stable right gone that is where they will start using as the excuse to fail and never come out of it right it will not be a yeah. consistent approach yeah, yeah. You don't. Mm -hmm. very nice very nice okay let's continue i think two more points uh, additional concepts related to attribution theory it is important to note that this discussion of attribution theory has barely scratched the surface right so unlike uh, applicability in in education where it's a little more deeper these next things are coming up just it's still very very young so additional concepts to attributional theory, uh, we have now um, approaches where we are looking at different motivational approaches, right? So we are saying learning goals, encourage students to set and pursue learning goals rather than performance goals, right? Three idiots, Amir Khan, uh, knowledge ke piche bhago, kamyabi doesn't happen always, right? People have, there are geniuses out there. In my engineering uh, first year, I had a guy who had set up, he stayed over, so we, we were having a whole new lab of computers being set up. This guy stayed overnight. In one night, he set up a 50 uh, PC machine, Linux and Windows operating system, networked and ready for all the students to use, right? He was that genius. You know what happened? He could not clear B. And you know what happened? We said, oh, you have learning and learning goes. No, but he couldn't clear B. He, he, he's not into that engineering line and computer lines at all. Right, so it's not really always necessary uh, that learning goals uh, are the only approach. There is a performance goal based approach. So there are some people who have performance goals, right? Where, where they say, I only feel happy if I have, you know, in my corporate world, for example, I can go with the best innovative use case, I can have the best knowledge, but I need to meet my numbers when I was a sales uh, person, right? I need to make that million euro uh, sale in my year. It's not just because I want my bonus, but that's my target. I would rate myself only by a performance, right? So there are uh, approaches and times when you have to give learning goals. There are approaches and times you have to give performance goals. And when I say give, I'm, I'm again, I always start with my own self, right? So uh, me being my first patient, me being my first student, right? So for myself also, I have to decide when is the learning goal applicability higher and when is the performance goal applicability, right? For example, personally, I am in MAPC course for learning and I'm, 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 I'm okay if I fail in my, uh, yeah, I'm not at that stage where I really need to worry about my passing and not passing. I don't rate myself with that. That's not my goal of achieving the, of coming into this section, right? But I want to try and pass, of course. So performance goals. Uh, then we have learner helplessness that we captured earlier, that repeated failure can have learner helplessness. And, and one of the discussions we were having in past week, I think KL gave a very good analogy of elephants, right? When they are tied with a chain from childhood, and then in, in, in once, once they grow, they can easily break that chain. But that's learner helplessness. They would not break it at all. They think they can't go, right? This is very much possible for humans. Time and again, repetitive failure, learner helplessness. And this is one of the major, major causes for depressive um, symptoms coming in, right? So we have to be very careful. Sorry on the learner helplessness uh, part as well. Self-handicapping, now some people would actually, it's a self-harming kind of situation, right? We would create impediments to come up with examples or excuses of not achieving and doing things. For example, drinking too much alcohol, now you are not in a state to study, right? And then you just create, you, you are, that's nobody else did it. You do it to yourself to make sure that you, your efforts get reduced and eventually you don't achieve it, right? So there are these, uh, concepts that of self-handicapping also comes into picture. A lot of people do it. It's still around attribution theory and expectancy, uh, expectancy uh, balance model, which means goal versus effort. 
or goal versus how much tough it is. And very interestingly, you know, uh, it, and this is also part of the ga gamification theory that if it is too easy, even if the goal is too high, I mean, if the returns are too high, you know, people wouldn't do it. We need a sense of achievement, which means that there's, and if it is too hard, also we will give up, right? So complete gamification theory, how we get addicted to these games, they use this uh, principle very nicely that we should have a moderate um, effort to achieve something good uh, for a probability of a success, right? So if, if, if there's a moderate probability of the success, we will, we will get interested, we feel it is pursuing um, yes, the value of pursuing that thing. But if it's very, very hard or very low, probably we wouldn't do it. For example, it doesn't excite us. It doesn't motivate us to do uh, that uh, part. Right? And that is that is what Atkinson started from 1964 and his studies around around expect uh, expectancy valence uh, model. Right. So what you achieve and how hard it is to achieve or the probability of success in that aspect. Right. And once you clear moderation, moderate uh, thing, it becomes easier for you. Right. So every ceiling once reaches a new floor philosophy. So now you need a little bit harder. But at that level for you, that next step is again a next moderate level, uh, again a next moderate level. So, so on and so forth. So that is the expectancy balance model. And I think this is the law. I don't know. Uh, so understanding one's own behavior, it is important to note that this discussion, blah, 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 sketch the surface barely. So social comparison of understanding so what uh, attribution theory is also bringing now is how do you how do you evaluate one's uh, own approach is also comparing it with the social thing right if if the majority of my social um, uh, judgments uh, is similar to what i am thinking maybe it's right right so that is what we, we comply um, knowing our emotions so one important outgrowth notion that we evaluate our abilities. Uh, so the, the concrete, so uh, not going into verbose from the textbook. So go and look at the Stanley Scatter and Jerome Singer's um, 1962 experiment. This is very, very good read where we don't know what emotion should be in, in a particular situation. Uh, we we then rely on one of the one of the other persons, right? On a, one of the confederator, for example. So for example, should I be feeling angry? Uh, if, if in a situation where I'm very uncertain, I don't know, but I have to show some emotion. So I see, oh, that person is getting pissed and angry. That's maybe the right thing to do. So I'll also be pissed and angry. You know, it, it sounds very, it sounds very superlative, but that, that is how we are conditioned, for example. And, and look at that, that experiment. I think it was around, uh, I'm not sure now, if it was around injecting something, uh, you know, in a group where there was one confederator, and then people didn't know, and actually that was that was not 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 any chemical, right? And people didn't know how to respond. And then one person was just being angry and shouting and etc. So everybody started doing it. I mean, you can look at it in examples in standing in the queue, etc., or waiting at an airport. Generally, everybody is quiet, but there is this one um, uh, fellow who would lose it, right? And we all say, "Ah, oh, yes, this is what he's saying is right." For example. Right. Um, another episode of things going viral. A black person died. Hey, everybody is now complaining. Yes, yeah, this is something wrong, completely wrong. Mm, uh, and there are so many other stories where after some days, the other side of the story would come. Right. For example, Delhi, that Aam Aadmi Party thing where there was a guy who has been shamed across India. He, he lost his job. There's a police complaint, etc., etc., etc. Three months down the line, other side of the story comes where there is a proof from an elderly couple saying, oh, she was bullying him. And when he did not agree or comply, uh, to to uh, listen to her, she started uh, a live video and said wrong things about him, which were completely uh, misguided. Everybody jumped on that guy. He was shamed so much, right? So then, then that is where we start complying to to the larger uh, emotions or conflict when we are not sure actually what it is. Uh, Bem self perception theory, and then there is another theory which will come into picture. So cognitive dissonance. This is very interesting uh, topic. For example. Again, I'm not going into that verbose, it will confuse you a lot. But for example, the, the topic that we are talking about is, um, I do not like psychology, for example. You, you might have two things in your head. I do not like psychology, but I constantly read about this topic, right? So for example, I don't like topic of spirituality, but I keep searching on those topics and start reading about it, right? So what, which one is the true one? Do you really like psychology or do you not like psychology, right? For example, me, I can give you a context. I don't like studying. I, I mean, studying examination is something I, I always feared since school age. 
and now I'm doing my second master's. I don't know why I'm doing it. So which is the real me, right? Do I really like studying and getting uh, clearing exams, or I hate studies, which I think is my true self, right? Which, which there are conflicting things. So what Bem's self perception theory says is that um, looking at our own cues, which are there, uh, we are try to understand ourselves. And if there is a weak cue, we look at our behavior to understand it, right? Which means there is a weak cue in me saying maybe I don't like studies, but then I look at my behavior. What am I doing? I'm I am still looking at courses, uh, Udemy courses, master's courses. I'm still doing courses, so maybe that's the fact. I really like studying, right? That's that's maybe that is a fact. So I look at my behavior, and uh, when my cue internal cue of emotion is weak, then I look at my behavior and uh, interpret based on that. Whereas cognitive dissonance, what it says is, for the same example, what cognitive dissonance theory says is that there has to be a dissonance. There has to be a conflict between uh, my two unsettled emotion. And in that conflict between two uh, inconsistent beliefs about myself, um, I come upon uh, the uh, uh, motivation to find out the truth of myself and, and then settle on one. Right? Both of them saying very similar things. The difference really is, okay, my uh, battery is turning out, but yeah, I continue. So the, the difference between cognitive dissonance and uh, the self-perception theory is the following. Cognitive dissonance is there has to be a dissonance. There has to be an internal conflict, which is the motivation for me to settle and find out my own self. Um, self-perception says is no, I should know my emotion. And when my emotional my emotion is weak, I just observe my behavior to conclude, right? Uh, anybody uh, uh, doubt on, on difference between these two things? Because personally, when I read the content and text, it was very hard for me to conclude what, what they are trying to say in the book, right? But I, I think I, I finally understand it this way. But anybody, either summarize it for me, what you think the difference between cognitive dissonance and self-perception is? Or if you have question, ask me. Let's let's clear this point before we go ahead. Anybody want to attend? Am I still audible? Somebody say yes. You are audible. You are audible. Okay, then I go ahead. Let's let's continue. If nobody wants to summarize this, um, uh, dissonance is conflict. Self perception is knowing myself uh, from my emotion. If my emotion cue is weak, uh, seeing it through my behavior. Okay, let's continue. Um, sorry, oh, where is my previous slide? Okay, just calling it out. So looking at it from a different perspective. So self perception theory explains. Creation of new self-knowledge following behavior that does not conflict with the clear initial self view, right? Whereas cognitive dissonance explains change. It's not create a new self-knowledge, right? It's a change in the existing self-knowledge, which means there is a conflict existing. Uh, following freely chosen behavior, like uh, continuing to explore and study the topics, even though I don't like it, that does conflict with clear initial self view. Right. So this is where the difference lies. And these are the two approaches of knowing the self, like self-perception, cognitive dissonance. I think with this, uh, for the unit two, I believe we are done. Uh, so thank you. And if there are questions, any anything that anybody wants to share, I think we have last 15 minutes. I don't I don't have any other topic that I would want to cover. Um, if there are any questions, any comments. Any feedback, uh, most welcome. It was a good session, Jamal. First, thank you. And uh, the way you prepared the slide, it was very good. So I think you summarized. Uh, hello. Yeah, Jamin. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Sandhya here. Uh, okay. Yeah, attribution theory. I just want an example. How do you apply in therapies? Uh, like suppose depression therapy, you're using it, treating a person suffering from depression. Okay. So see, attribution theory, uh, let's understand back on what attribution theory is. Right? Attribution theory is attributing your 
state with an explanation, right? Which means why yeah. are you in that state? Now, the powerful part about attribution theory is, uh, uh, again, let's understand from a student's perspective and then we try to touch upon depression part. So from a student's perspective, the way you give an explanation to your success and failure will define your motivation to persist your efforts to continue, right? That is what we can do. So we know that the success and failure in itself are not responsible for my emotional state, but the explanations in between are uh, responsible for my emotional state, right? Um, right? So now coming, using the attribution theory in, in trying to say, uh, if I am depressed, how would I apply attribution theory on my own depression, right? Which means the yeah. reason why I am depressed, the event that has happened that is making me depressed is not the reason I'm feeling depressed, but the explanation and the thoughts that I'm feeding to my event is actually responsible for feeling and making me depressed, right? So that's the first step I need to understand about my own self. If I am my patient, I need to understand this was the event. This is not the reason I'm depressed, but my thoughts that I'm putting on it is the reason why I'm depressed. So first I need to chart it out. What are those thoughts, right? And then those thoughts come out under the uh, perceptions of cognitive biases, distortions, prototyping schema, uh, overthinking, over expectations, blah, 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 blah. A lot of cognitive distortions and uh, biases could be belonging in that thought. And then there is a powerful notion over there that if you change the thought, your emotion changes. You don't have to change the situation to change the thought. So, 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 for example, uh, so for example, a depressed person will have all the negative thoughts. So any anything success that happens, he will he will think that he is not he is no way contributing to it. So in that case, so in therapy, you need to, uh, you need to make him think that uh, he is responsible for something good happening. So you need to yes. change that type of yes. attitude. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. But, but, but the how, right? The point is again, in therapy, it's very important that it's not advice or guiding, right? Which means only he can change it. He or she can change it. Now, how can we facilitate that is the is the question right and and i think there is this uh, topic of cognitive behavioral therapy the abc approach uh, again as i mentioned the event the thoughts which are all negative as you said and then thought okay. affecting your outcome which is the emotional state which is depression right but it's not only yeah. about thought what you should help identify in that thought is the uh, cognitive bias or cognitive distortion which is underlying that thought because that thought will not only be for that situation it will be generally throughout the life right. in lot of other yeah. things yeah. yeah so that pattern identification for me is already a very first strong liberating state uh, for the person who is in depression itself right coming to a level yeah. where you understand oh this is my cognitive bias that itself is a very very powerful first step right and from there we need to go on how can we challenge those and then we have challenging uh, approaches so we have something like uh, act, uh, activation behavioral therapy which is the third generation cbt topic which behavioral change the thought and then there are other uh, targets where you can actually um, isolate that bias or distortion and and challenge it right so socratic questioning uh, to challenge the fact right so there are then then but but coming to a point where you can identify the thoughts and second classifying the thought as a bias and a distortion and when I say classifying, not, not a therapist classifying it, but uh, the self classifying it. Oh, yes, this is my bias. That to reach there uh, itself is a very, very big achievement, according to me. Okay. For the self or for the person who is going through the. Nobody else can tell him, oh, this is what your thought pattern is. It wouldn't help at all. Okay. I mean, as you told about uh, that cognitive bias, so see, most of the time, if you talk to people like it's my experience, you say that you, you understand that someone may have a cognitive bias or I yeah. may also have a cognitive bias inherently. Okay. But how yes. to uh, uh, convince a person or myself or other that it is, it is, a, it is a cognitive bias. It's nothing uh, because people come with the argument that it's my experience. That's how yes. I have seen the life. Yes. And uh, how yes. can you say that it's a bias? It's, it's a, it's a yes. word around me. Yes. And, uh, yes. How how would no, you? That's, uh, that's, that's that's a very beautiful question that you have asked, Siddharth. And that is where I mean, 
yeah, as I mentioned, helping our own selves. Um, as I always say, I'm my patient, right? So making myself understand that this is my bias and distortion in itself is a big achievement. And that, that is the reason why I said it's a very hard activity to do. And you cannot you cannot tell it to anybody. Nobody can tell it to me, right? If somebody tells me, oh, this is you, I'll say, <laughs> screw yourself. This is not right, right? I mean, nobody can, only the self can help. And and I mean, I'm more than happy to take some cognitive bi uh, behavioral um, therapy uh, session of explanation of what that therapy is. What I love about that is, you know, it needs to change. There has to be a change in perception. It's different than a usual um, uh, psychology approach, right? The psychology psychologist or psychiatrist try to look what is wrong in you. What cognitive behavioral therapy starts at is that there is nothing wrong in anyone. That's the first statement. The second statement it tells us that the only reason why we have this um, unwanted uh, outcomes of behaviors and feelings is because we don't understand ourselves better, right? So it's only a question of bridging that gap of understanding and it's same with all of us. We are all in it together. Nobody holier than thou syndrome and there is nothing wrong with you, right? That's the that's a very different. So, oh, in childhood at five years, your father slapped you. So now you are a aggressive person. No, it, uh, that is the psychiatrist. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. That's the psychiatrist uh, regular approach of American psychiatrist society. Cognitive behavioral therapy comes from a different angle, right? So there is nothing wrong with you. So first you need to start with that before you can identify bias. Because if you say that is wrong with you, Nobody, even ourselves, won't don't want to judge ourselves, right? We want to feel good. We don't want to judge ourselves. Oh, this is a bias in a negative sense in me. So first, I need to tell, oh, there is nothing wrong with me, and now I'm just classifying my thought patterns. And if that thought pattern is impacting negatively on my emotion, it is wrong. I need to change it. Else, I say, no, I want to stick with it. There is nothing wrong with it. I'm not affected by it. I'll continue. Then continue. Yeah, that's, that's the difference in our world. So basically, yeah. we can just like add to it. We can divide the bias thing like where you are going to hurt yourself or it is like in the long term, it is going to hurt someone or hurt yourself. Then it could be like taken according to where you push that person. We have two aspects here. If you know that DSD and WPSS where uh, we will tell classify the people uh, into different category. If they are okay by making them understand the situation, they are ready to accept or by a long term, they'll understand it. That's individual perception. As I clearly told that I'll go through every because I had my experience as well as like that is my nature. If someone judging me that, okay, she is very creepy, she is looking at different aspects of it and before making a friendship or something, no. That is how we are. We are all individual. There is no positive or negative things. Okay. So, considering that WPSS comes as where you need to like uh, put that person in the social life, there you can go ahead and you they are, you should tell them they are part of it. But uh, there are certain situations where cognitive bias will come in such a way that they will end up hurting someone else. That's the picture that uh, they have to be treated and DSTV has to be implemented. There are two categories yeah, we yeah. can consider here. Absolutely. I mean, thank you for bringing that up, right? So there is a there is a there is a bridge between counseling and clinical psychology. <laughs> if, if CBT is not really going to help much once the cases become more clinical, you know, I mean, at least what I think. Uh, but yeah, you really, really need to be aware of that boundary. And, and again, CBT is goal oriented. If the person doesn't have a goal, which means, for example, depression case, as Sandhya brought up, if the person doesn't have a goal of uh, not being depressed, you can't help the person to achieve anything. You can't tell, oh, your thinking pattern is wrong, change. No, he doesn't want to change. So the person has to be very clear that there is a goal, right, uh, that he, he or she wants to achieve. And then we can go on to, on to the route of, okay, there is nothing wrong with you, point number one. Point number two, let's realize for, and make them realize for themselves, not by telling it to them, right? Make them realize for themselves that, oh, this thinking pattern is affecting my, uh, getting me into my negative outcomes, the unwanted outcome, right? Not the event. I mean, for example, I, there is a breakup between two lovers, right? I am depressed. Maybe the breakup in itself is not the reason for real depression. The thoughts and the things around it is the real reason, right? And that has to be self-realized. Nobody can tell it to the person. And person would only self-realize it if the person has a goal to come out of it. There are so many people I, I come across who say they are angry, they are stressed, but they don't want to let go of the anger and stress. They say, if I'm not angry, if I'm not stressed, I'll not use that as a motivation to find another job, for example. Right? So it's, it's, you would be surprised with the kind of, kind of goals the people would have and how, 
how and why they want to maybe stick to their bias and distortion and it's fine we all have our biases and distortions and as I, that's why i said there is nothing wrong in anybody um and and uh, nobody can help anybody you can just guide them and to see themselves better from there it's their choice but enough said i mean if anybody is really interested on cbt based things just reach out to me we can we can definitely have have a uh, good talk around it okay sure any any other question any other feedback from anybody before we wind up i didn't realize i would like two hours i thought it will finish it in one hour but yeah it went quick no it was really it was good actually it was very interactive and everybody discussed so many things so it was good and the way you presented you uh, outlined this stuff it was very professional great thank you and uh, meanwhile as you told that uh, we start uh, with the primacy i try uh, before we put that thing uh, discuss that thing i try i tried uh, uh, looking at your linkedin profile <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as you mentioned this thing, oh, I thought, oh my God! So it is something very inherent that has become now. <laughs> you no, know, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people go go against some of these things, right? But we we all have that. Let's just say that. See, basically, it is a good thing to know someone in a positive way. There is nothing like you are not going to post something or you are not going to talk. At least we can find out a common interest or something related to each other. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, so much so that right, uh, like, uh, right, Arpana, ma'am. I mean, we we realize the the name of our kids are similar sounding. That's it. Then itself is a good connect, right? I mean, Obviously. that was a, that was a good connect point for us. Yeah. Uh, there there will be certain things we we have to open up somewhere. We have to talk to each other. And certain time, to be frank with you, gender barrier comes. Okay, whether that person is like how whether she is working or non working, you don't know anything about me. I just suddenly pitched yeah. into the group and suddenly I told like if uh, you need any help, talk to me because I am mad like that. I want to help people. Yes. That's that's craziness I have, as I said. Like that is my. <laughs> yes. So yes. when that yes. thing happens, like why she is doing what, what benefit she has, these are the questions which will come to people's mind. So go through my profile. There are a number of people. I keep on posting for free counseling. Come to me for free education. Come to me right now. From two three hours, I'll take free lessons for the poor kids. That's what I do. People think like, why you are doing it? Uh, nice. so when we will understand, okay, there is no benefit for her. So you will understand about my life clearly. That is her madness. What she is doing. So all of us, we have that thing. In fact. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of people go to my Insta and find out that now you know it. Like, uh, right? I mean, I have these uh, irregular friends of friends talk on psychology topic and stuff like that, right? I mean, people really think, why do you want to do it, or you want to advertise yourself? But many people don't know, right? Most of these things I do it absolutely with no money involved in it, right? I just want to help others uh, with a thing with my own experience. I have gone through a lot. I was my own uh, patient, as I always say. I was my own student. And if I can be of help to somebody, even five percent, ten percent, in this area of psychology, I mean that is what that is what my passion is, right? And that is what my attempt is. So, and people get to know from that angle, I think it helps. But otherwise, there are a lot of lot of negative perceptions about this. I oh, why are you advertising? You're not yet a psychiatrist, and blah 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 blah. A lot of it, right? So, it comes no, out good in those. Psychologists, they had their own experience. Then only they took up their work. In fact, like the people who took it as a passion. you can take okay. any like so many people's name we will be going through so all those names like we go through their past there is one thing which inspired them to help others yes yes, yes. and i, I mean uh, this is tempting me to tell a story as of now but i think people don't may not want to hear it i, I tried to tell it in our in the last friends of friends session but i'll tell it later right there is this i mean you can only help others if if you have been there for example and there is a very nice story around it of i tell the story but maybe maybe some other time most of the people are leaving if someone says i'm okay i'm waiting yeah i'm also <laughs> okay so there is there is this very okay then we continue right and uh, there is there is this very nice story right so there was this a guy who was walking in 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 some uh, big farmlands and he suddenly fell into a very big pit in a very big hole right and there was loose sand around it he he tried very hard to come out of it he tried to breathe he tried to keep patience he cried but he just couldn't come out and it was comparatively isolated place so there were nobody around to hear him uh, uh, hear his shouts so then what happened is after certain hours passed 
there was this guy there was one guy who came up on the top of the um, pole where he was and he's saying oh my child what are you doing down there and he's saying oh mister i'm so thankful you are here i have fell in this hole I'm, i tried my best i couldn't come out blah 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 so this guy was looking like a monk he said my son god will always help you i'll give you a full proof to this okay do this chanting a very secret chanting do this for 108 times uh, and then do meditation and then try coming out you will come out this fellow said okay thank you very much and the the monk from above left this fellow started chanting started meditating tried to come out couldn't come out again few hours uh, passed by another guy came he said uh, he said oh fellow what are you doing here he said oh i fell there was this monk crazy monk he gave me chanting i tried all of it i couldn't come out that fellow started laughing oh how gullible you are right whenever we are in problem we try to believe everything what people say i will tell you what to do the only way to come out from here is very scientific you need to build your body you need to do this yoga you need to build up your core strength and then you should try and jump and you should be able to jump oh i can jump double this size for example doing this yoga try it for few days you will be able to come out so like, yeah makes sense so chanting and all is crap let me build up and then i can jump like that other fellow so he starts doing this blah 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 a few days go he tries he couldn't now his body is aching he's tired he's hungry chanting gone yoga gone, gone. Mm. then comes along a psych a psychologist he said oh guy you need to think about things you need to have a clear head you think about the situation evaluate every soil every path around you need to find one step at a time blah 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 so this fellow climbs around 20 percent uh using the scientific approach falls on his head gets himself injured even further then after all of this comes one guy a very normal looking guy that is saying hey who are you this fellow says no it doesn't matter why are you here why is your head bleeding why have why are you stuck over here so sorry before you tell anything take this bottle of water please drink water right i'm sure you must be thirsty so that fellow drinks the water and then says this, the entire story and this that fellow laughs he said wait a minute and then that fellow does something which this the person in the hole is completely surprised you know that fellow who is standing out on the hole jumps inside and this guy saying, oh, are you crazy? Why are you coming inside over here? I'm stuck for days and I tried everything what everybody told me to and I still couldn't come out. Why are you here? <laughs> this guy is saying, my friend, two months back, I was in the same hole. Uh, From then on, there have been different kinds of people, more people than what you have met. And they have asked me to do n number of things. Nothing helped. And then eventually, I could figure a way to come out of this hole. Right, and I'm confident that there is a way to do that step by step. And so I'm down here with you. I completely understand the situation you are in. Let me show you. And you try to do what I did, step by step. And let's see if you come out with me again. Mm. Right, and and that's. I mean, I don't want to get into an implicit moral of the story, but that's that for me is is a real counseling. That that for me is real coaching. Right, um, mm. and then nothing else. First, you have to jump in in the situation and then you you, you, you should have been in that no you should have been you should be able to completely understand what that person is going through to try if not you can and you can never help anybody else he he, he or she has to do it and he, he, themselves right you he, he could he cannot carry him outside right yeah. and let's not advise let's not guide somebody with anything uh that we are we have not been through personally and we have not experienced it in one way or the other right it may not be exactly the same hole it may not be ex but really have you gone through it all have you do you really understand the other side of the story before telling that fellow hey don't don't worry be relaxed do you have that authority of telling somebody don't worry be relaxed right have you been relaxed in similar situation then go and talk about it right and and that's 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 pretty much the gist of my my entire life philosophy. <laughs> no, that's a summary of what I wanted to tell in fact. Yeah, 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 I know. And that's why I said, as soon as you said that, it reminded me of the storyline twice. So Definitely whoever is still on the call, thank you for being there. Is, uh, it's uh, sometimes like more than anything, experience matters. But yeah, you right. can see a few of them, they feel it and they express and they think and they do research and then they come back with the answer. Because to be frank with you, you, you don't have to be a rape victim to understand the con con like condition of a rape victim. So Absolutely. when that thing happens, it is the, uh, what do you say, empathy of the 
person it is not like you are not there to sit and uh, talk to someone first understand what that person is going through when you can feel yeah. it instead of being in that situation that is also a kind of experience uh, yes, how yes. this happens no, in the for, for rape tv serials what they do like uh, the same call like parents or people will be sitting papa what oh, this happened that happened when the same thing will be happening to someone in the real life but uh, they don't even care to be frank i have seen that in most of the people so then definitely you are not the right person people can approach that's how it is no, absolutely but but coming to that very strong answer or strong uh, analogy on rape victim right now now of course you don't need to be a rape victim or you don't have to you, you should not have done rape to try and talk to a rape victim to come out of it right of course not but when you understand the distortion and biases that rape victim had which landed him to do those things have you really uh, understood those distortion by that distortion and biases again it's a common thread what i like to believe in all of all of us humans right it may manifest in different ways but that distortion or bias or similar distortion and bias must have been in you and you would have done some other things right um uh, not not such bad things but you you would have experienced those distortion and biases to a very core level right and then you can relate to that distortion and bias not the act and see the act the final act or behavior in my viewpoint is just the 5% difference between all the human being right below 90 95% we are all the same right and many people don't agree to this uh, aspect you know all the confidence people versus all the shy people or all the criminal versus all the saints i think the manifestation outside is is that 5% and it's significant i agree to that right that, that i cannot compare a saint to a to a, um, a rapist but that's manifestation part but below how the mind works um, unless it's of course biological and other things that we, we don't need to go at a cognitive level i think we are all at a very similar plane and and if we have understood one such big cycle within us we can now relate to and make other person see it in themselves and then if they want to help themselves then it they come out of if they just don't they want to stay within that hole nobody in the world can help them to come out true yeah but enough said i think good yeah. discussion thank you everyone for your time and yeah, more than happy to engage with all, all of you on on studies uh, outside study discussion right i mean i, I always keep having this friends of friends etc for which i post stories on my insta and whatsapp feel free to join in whenever you want sure sure that's great jamin so all great right. insight on everything yeah thank you thank you everyone thanks a lot for your thank time you, bye 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 bye